Simply to put pen to paper is an enormous presumption. To write is to believe that via frozen words we can better express ourselves than through any other medium. Writing then is only an extension of a need for a clarification, a need to create a text that others can repudiate but not alter. I admire above all those writers who know which ideas should be suggested to the reader as opposed to being explained to them. Exhaustively scribbling every bit of one's ideas in all their minute detail displays a harsh contempt for the reader and insults his intelligence. I will note that for this compulsion we can swearly blame the quill-grinding German authors, although the French were just as quick to pick up on the trend. Nowadays the compulsion is universal. No academic and few novelists dare to treat their readers with the respect of a subtle text. This is perhaps the greatest sin of contemporary literature, and one that gives me cause more than any other to abdicate responsibility in reading it to future generations. I have thought for some time now that a piece of philosophy is better expressed by a skilled poet than by an intelligent philosopher. Infiltration is a preferable tactic to frontal assaults. But let us clarify something. By advocating suggestive and subtle writing, we do not permit vagueness. A vaguely formulated idea is one condemned to be forgotten. If words have an objective purpose, then it is the clarification of our own thoughts. To have written a vague text, therefore, is to have cast aside the very reason one set out to write in the first place. A suggested and subtle text is only worthwhile if within its payload are seeds capable of a rich blossom when they are bedded. I also admire those writers who know, and more importantly, who utilise the limits of their descriptive powers. When we look upon a place, it is the impression it leaves upon us that fuels our prose, not the place itself. Thus, all writing, like all art, is chiefly a deception. We aim to impress upon others the echo of an impression that we advertise as a real place. The ability of a good writer to sell his readers anything in the universe is why the fictional kingdoms enthrall us as much as, if not more than, the real ones do. I believe it is this same fact of our psychology that makes us admire both good writers and good thieves. The complexity and intelligence of their heists is so admirable we feel honoured to have been deceived. And what of the act of writing itself? People who do not write, or only pretend to write, are often under the illusion that one day, should the inspiration take them, they could have a readable work spring from them like a dove from an old loft. They do not understand that even the most execrable, the most mediocre books, require a deceptive level of talent to write, and it never comes easily. I suspect that every man who ever wrote did so not because he was secure in his thoughts enough to put them down for posterity, but because he was deeply insecure, because he did not really trust his own opinions, his own mind, his own abilities, his own inner life, and so thought to purify it in the salt of posterity. Perhaps if I were arrogant enough for a moment to put forward something I share in common with all writers, it would be that I have always felt the weight of my own mediocrity. But by writing, we dare to whisper to ourselves, do I possess an ounce of talent? And what then? Talent, like a fetus, only begins to breathe after we have given birth to it. And like any serious writer knows, even a few choice words cause enormous pain as they pass through one's femur. In the age when all wrote on paper, no manuscript was free from the innumerable strikes of ink, the harsh tears of anger and frustration as poor words of birth that do not conform to the grandiose palaces of our imaginations and the rigours of our monologues. Even after our sentences are born, they must endure a seemingly endless testing and torturing before they grace the eyes of another. As Nicholas Gomez put it, the writer who does not torture his sentences tortures his readers. But even if we submit to our mediocrity, abandon all ambition, and write simply for no other reason than to clarify ideas we formulate in our minds, we are still treated to a potentially enormous amount of pleasure. The satisfaction of one's own thoughts expressed in a manner free from mental tossing and turning is not one to be sneered at. I do worry, however, that in these words I have implied that good writing is something expressly quantifiable or teachable. 
Unfortunately for us, a phrase can seem like the height of written achievement or a catastrophe in ink, depending on the many levels of context, the time, our mood, the reader's mood, or perhaps even the light of the sun through the windows. The daily pain of a writer is to come back to his desk each morning to discover that the rhetorical gems he thought he had dug up the night before are really worthless, misshapen rocks bound for the rubbish heap. But despite all that, at least for some of us, the act of writing saves us from boredom and gives a definite dimension to the lives we live in our heads. Of course, what we write must also entertain he who writes it. This is obvious. Far too many people write in the modern day because they have an adolescent admiration for the writer as a bourgeois object, as a personality to be admired in of itself. They are perhaps the most foolish people alive, for they write books they never themselves would read. They're like starving peasants devoting their lives to growing fruits they could not bear to eat. I write because I want to leave behind a dialogue for those who are like-minded, for no other reason than perhaps to touch a few souls I will never know in person. This simple thought gives me enormous pleasure, and, even with all of the above things considered, reason enough to write.